Hey, welcome to the Tac Talks podcast. Tac Talks is a place where I sit down with some of the brightest and most influential people in the tech industry in the UK. We talk about their journey to where they are now, what they have going on behind the scenes, and we talk about some of the hot topics that I know people are going to want to know the answer to. When we started Tact, we were very passionate about giving people in the tech industry a voice, and with Tact Talks, we've done just that. I hope you enjoy the episode. Welcome to the Tact Talks podcast. Today, I'm joined by Mikey Smith, Technical Director at Money Supermarket. Hi, Mikey. How are you doing? I am really good, Jack. How are you? Yes, not bad, not bad. Thank you. Thanks for coming on and uh, another gorgeous day in Manchester. It's amazing. Uh, it was a tough walk in, actually. The temperature's already pretty high. Oh, God. No, don't say that. Don't say that. We've got a full day of podcast. That's not going to be good. Um, but look, I, I always like to kick these things off. Anyone who doesn't know who Mikey Smith is, who is Mikey Smith? Uh, good question. Uh, so I am, as you say, technology director at Money Supermarket. So I've been there for roughly three years. Um, and I look after what we would call our, or what we used to call our core and personalization team. And um, we now call it the customer lifetime value teams, where we're actually looking at how we engage our customers better, get to know a little bit more about them and try to advance our relationship with the customer. Um, I also look after our internal platform teams as well now, which is quite an interesting challenge. Um, so yeah, that's something I'm really looking forward to helping evolve as well. Amazing. Three years. Does it feel like it's been three years? No, it's flown by. I mean, we obviously had the pandemic in the middle, which caused a bit of havoc. It's been a thoroughly enjoyable three years, I think. Amazing. So, because um, probably people can tell by listening to the podcast that you haven't got the traditional Manchester accent. No, I am... Um, not native to Manchester, I suppose. So I'm originally from over near Liverpool. Um, moved over here when I met my partner. And so obviously Manchester's got an amazing, vibrant tech scene. And um, so it was a place to be, really. Saved me trips down the M62. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Um, so your career, because you've had quite a, an illustrious career, really, and very technical, and you've done loads of different stuff. How did you, how did you get into tech first off? I think it's a great question. Well, yeah, I mean, that's quite an interesting story, actually. So I I always knew that I wanted to do something with technology. I used to love understanding how things work, breaking them by taking them apart and never figuring out how to get them back together again. But I just parents used, love that. <laughs> yeah, I just used to love, you know, like taking things apart and seeing how they were made and how they were pieced together. So I always knew I wanted to go into technology. Um, went through the natural flow of going and did a computer science course at Liverpool University. So pretty much a home bird most of the time. Um, and then whilst I was there, I actually worked part time in PC world. Um, I'm not sure if they exist anymore. I think they're like curries or something. Now. But um, So yeah, I was like, um, used to sell printers. And this guy came in one day and said that he was looking to start up a consultancy, come in to buy a printer got chatting to him, said he was looking to start a consultancy. And it all sounded really too good to be true. So this consultancy was the first time working with the United Nations over in Rome. So I went home, told my parents, saying like, oh my God, that sounds like too good to be true. There's something wrong with that. But um, yeah, that got me on the career into software development, really. So I started working on a Java application to help track like... Um, where fish was caught in the ocean and like what type of species there were. It was really quite an interesting project. Oh my God, what an incredible start to your career. So what, this random guy just comes in yeah. to PC World and says, I am Ike, do you fancy come and work on a United Nations project with me? Yeah, yeah. I obviously owe him a huge debt of gratitude. <laughs> um, so if you are listening, David, uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> wow, yeah, thank you, David. Thanks for giving us Mikey. Um, so then what happened after that? I dotted around a little bit, so... I tended to have 10 years around like two to three years so after I left um, NTA Solutions I went up to a veterinary wholesaler up in Scotland so moved pretty far away uh, went up into a place called Dumfries which is just over the border again learned a whole new craft there so whereas we were working in quite a, a rigorous um, software house I suppose as part of the consultancy working with the domain and you know, following like proper principles go into somebody where you could almost just find your own problems to solve. So we were working on integrating with like different telephone systems, helping to improve like the picking lines. And the big thing that I really found interesting was like, this was where I kind of like got a real 
insight into actually how you could really use different technology in different ways was that we actually found this little RF device reader, which was like, when we're talking like back in 2002, um, which actually we wrote like a mapping software on it. And it helped guide people around the warehouse and find the right products to pick, make sure that it was scanned onto the correct van. Um, and we actually, as a result of that system, increased like order accuracy by like 90% or something. Yeah, it was a good project. Oh my gosh. And and you and and you also went contracting, didn't you? You were contracting for a while. Yes. So came back to the Northwest for a little while, worked with a couple of companies in the Northwest, and then decided that I wanted to go contracting just to get a bit of experience and working around in the circuit, as we call it, in the Northwest. So went to a lot of the big players like Autotrader, Booking.com, got to see how they build software. Um, and then I suppose kind of fell into leadership. Balanced leadership. Yeah. So, so you got the job at Money Supermarket, and, and I guess how has your role um, developed as you since you started to, to where you are now? Yeah. So I started as a development manager or head of engineering, where I was looking after trying to help um, you know facilitate the teams and making sure that they were set up efficiently, that they had everything that they need, um, that we were helping develop their careers for them personally. Um, and then during the pandemic, um, things changed in Money Supermarket a little bit. We lost people. And I got the opportunity to get promoted to technology director. So pretty much within the same department that I was originally working in, uh, but just with a broader scope, I suppose, in terms of like making sure that we were following our strategy, that the teams were set up for success, um, and just making sure that we were connected. Because looking after like seven to eight teams, you know, they all kind of like intrinsically know what they're doing. But I suppose my role is just helping them connect the dots and understanding, you know, how what they're doing helps benefit the company and how it ladders up to the, the overall strategy. Wow. Did you ever think you were going to be a, a technology director? Not really, no. I mean, I'll, I'll be honest, I always felt that I would be more of an individual contributor. Mm. When I fell into leadership, it was purely... It wasn't by accident, it was by choice, I would say. Um, and just found that I had a real passion for like working much more collaboratively with people and helping them get better in their career and you know, really making sure that they were leveling up and that you know, we were moving forward as a business and that they were moving forward as individuals. Love that. So going from, an, in, like, as you said, individual contributor now to a, um, a leader, a tech leader, what, I guess what things have you learned and what, what struggles did you have originally when you first got into the role? Were there any? Yeah, I mean, there's always struggles. Um, I think the, the big thing that changes for you is scope. Mm -hmm. I was actually having a chat with somebody about this yesterday. Um, quite interestingly, who's recently moved up into a tech lead role and he's all, like starting to understand like, you know, how that role has evolved. But I think it always comes down to scope. And the biggest thing that I really struggled with is... I still love code. Like I still, you know, I was up late last night trying to fix one of our pipelines. Um, I just can't let it go a little bit, um, which was one of my own faults. But I think that learning to trust other people, that you know that they've got a level of detail that you could never possibly have and that your scope is just above that and you're helping them connect the bigger dots and learning to let go of that small amount of details, I think is always, always a bit of a struggle. Trying to empower your leadership team. I was recently reading that book by um, Work Rules. It's about Google <clears throat> and how they were set up. And that was a massive thing for them is just like making sure you're empowering your your leadership team. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's like one of the things that we really value, I think, at Money Supermarket, that diversity and the team make better products. Um, you know, without everybody's input into that, then you're just going to end up with one person's opinion on what this product should be or how it should be used. And it's not really representative of your customer base. So making sure, I suppose, that your workforce has the empowerment to push their, forward their ideas and have the ability to input ends up, you end up with a better product. Yeah, absolutely. So Money Supermarket, on that, massive business now, isn't it? I mean, how many people work for Money Supermarket? That's a good question. It's changed, but I think we're roughly about 600 people in total. So about most of that is, so technology, I think we're about 400. 400 people? Product technology. technology, yeah. Oh my God. And you look after all those people? 
No, I don't look after my Oh, right. God, my God. <laughs> Jeez, I was going to say, you don't, you don't look uh, that stressed out. <laughs> no, I've got, um, so there's three other peers as well of mine, uh, technology directors, and then obviously we partner up with product as well who have their own leadership teams as well. So, so 600 people in money supermarket, you cover everything in terms of um, trying to save people money, basically. What's the next step? Because it seems like how can you go any further? Good question. Yeah, I mean, so people at Money Supermarket will be bored of hearing me say this. So apologies for me always saying this. But if I look back around when Money Supermarket was concepted Mm -hmm. and thinking back to like technology is there to make people's lives easier, we saved a lot of people time by just coming to a website and giving you that easy view where you fill in a form over a couple of minutes and we show you a reasonably wide range of choice around like different products and like, you know, mainly car insurance back in the day. But if you think before the advent of that, people used to have to spend lots of time, hours on the phone, phoning around different um, insurance providers looking for the best price. Or if you were like me, you were just lazy and just went with the easiest option and just staying with your provider, but not necessarily always getting the best value or the best price out of that. So the advent of price comparison really changed people's ability to be able to view and compare the range of market. And I think we've kind of languished a little bit in that form filling mode for a little while where people come to our site, they got used to filling in like quite lengthy forms for whatever product you're looking at. You know, so if you're looking at um, motor insurance, then it could take you like three minutes to fill in the form if we've not got any data about you quite a boring task and um, nobody really wants to spend any time doing it so our focus at the moment is that when you give us that data once we'll capture it and we'll learn to evolve it we'll make sure that we age it correctly so you come back to us we know what you want and we just save you the time of having to fill in the form and just show you the answer straight away so just trying to trying to make the process of saving money even easier yeah, so whereas we, we speak about it, it used to be minutes to fill in the form, or hopefully now it's just seconds because you just confirm um, with a click glance that everything looks okay, and then you move on to see your results. Because I think one thing that we've learned as we've gone through um, trying to build out this new product is that you know people want to see what they're getting, so they want to know that the data that you're using to complete the forms is still correct. So how do we give them a reasonable summary to say, we know everything about you. Nothing hopefully has changed. Here's your opportunity to tell us and then take you on to the price at that point. What, what, I guess what's the goal? What's the purpose of Money Supermarket? What? The ultimate goal is to help more households save money. Um, and I think at this point where we are with the financial crisis, I think it's really important that we kind of like double down on that and really help households realize how they can save money. Um, so the other part of what we're trying to do as well, which I mentioned in our customer lifetime value stream, is helping customers connect more with our products because people do tend to land on money supermarket and know what they want. So you come to us, you know that you want motor insurance but or, or home insurance, which is one of our other big channels. But if we know your intent behind it or your goal is that you're moving house or that you're buying a new car, we can help you see more of that range of market that you don't just have to go to your dealer to see what, you know, if you're buying a car, like what their finance offers are. Mm-hmm. We can understand, hey, actually, Jack, you're, it looks like you're buying a car here. Did you know that this is all the types of finance and we'll help you find the right type of finance that suits you? Right, okay. So that's that's very interesting. So being a bit more intuitive with, with the, the, the choice that people are making so that you can offer them added bonuses and more more so just so that they have they know they have options yeah yeah definitely, yeah so if you look at our current marketing campaign we are trying to help people connect that so we've got the money super seven which is That's right yeah a band of um superheroes that are all dedicated to our main product channels but it's really just helping people understand that so we do more than just car insurance or home insurance or what whatever people use money supermarket for hopefully Eventually, what the plan is, you'd just be a one-stop shop and no one would have to ever have to go anywhere else. That's the aim, yeah. I mean, we're hoping that what we're building really is such a brand differentiator that there's no other reason to go anywhere else. You know, we're the first choice for, like, coming for price comparison insurance or home insurance. Um, want to make that journey so effortless mm. that it's a real brand differentiator and people think, well, I'm definitely using the supermarket again because it was such an effortless task. 
for one amazing purpose, especially, as you said, how um, how poignant it is now with, with what's going on with the looming recession that everyone keeps talking about. And um, I think any business that's trying to help households save money is going gonna, is gonna to do so well. And, you, and I assume growth plans wise, you, you, you guys are growing, right? Yes, we are. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, um, we're obviously been hit a little bit by, um, you know, what's happened with COVID and the energy crisis. Um, but yeah, we're definitely on the trajectory of growth at the moment, which is really quite exciting to see. Amazing. So is it just a case of we're just growing, growing as much as possible until we hit the stops or is there a, a number on it or? Yeah, I don't think there's a number on that. I think we just want to try and help as many households as we can save money and realizing that, you know, with that purpose, we, we should really be driving that forward. Obviously, we should market Java House, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, we've started to branch out a little bit. So, oh, cool. um, you know, part of our strategy as well is to like acquire and merge other companies in. And with that brings in quite a diverse tech stack as well, which sometimes brings challenges, but um, also opportunities. But yeah, we have some of our stack in .NET. We are in serverless now with Node, um, JS and JavaScript and still our traditional Java's backend. Okay, amazing. How do you compete with, I guess, other businesses in the local area hiring? Because that's a massive question right now, isn't it? I mean, the shortage of tech talent, and I know people are sick of hearing this, but uh, there re really is a shortage of tech talent, and because it, everything is now remote, you're not just competing with people in a 25-mile radius, you're now competing with people sometimes all around the world. Yep. How, I guess, how do you overcome that? Well, it is difficult. Um, there's definitely a shortage of talent um, in Manchester, um, just given the volume of companies that are, are looking to recruit. But I think two things that really would attract people to Money Supermarket are that we are, well, maybe three actually. So we've got a great purpose. I think it's really important, you know, that, you know, we are doing something hopefully that people can connect with and, you know, help do something better for people in the UK. But I also think that we have a really good tech stack. So we are, you know, we do value like making sure that we are modern on our tech stack, trying out new things that we're constantly trying to innovate and making sure that we're at the forefront, not the bleeding edge, but the forefront of technology. Um, but also just the people. I think we, we already have like really good people. And I think that's really the main selling point that you want to go somewhere where you're going to learn from people that you're going to get better at your craft. Um, and that you start to understand more about your journey into technology and we can help you with that. This might sound like a, a stupid, like non-techie question that I'm not too confident on, but um, is, is there a danger sometimes of being at the bleeding edge of technology? Yeah, I think there is. Yeah, I mean, we definitely try things quite often. So I wouldn't say that we necessarily adopt them, but we're very much following like the trial assess adopt model where we are looking at new technologies um, and we're trying to innovate. And then one, once we... We understand enough about them, we try and bleed them into the rest of the stack. But at the moment, I think one of our big focuses that we're trying to do is move, move much more towards a platform approach. Because in the past where we have given a lot of teams some of that freedom to explore new technologies, um, it's been great, you know, for people understanding technology, but what it's caused is like some operational complexity in terms of like our ability to run the stack and also for people to move between teams because what one team might be running is not necessarily what the other team is running. So there's a learning curve. So what we want to do is try and create a more central platform where here's our golden path of how you would deploy something into our environment. And we help people focus on problems that are unique to money supermarket rather than just, um, you know, like how do I deploy something into production? Do you think uh, I'm, it's incredible to hear that you're making that journey into part of it's going to be, I assume it's going to have a lot of challenges, but it will be very rewarding, I assume, when you get there. Given your background, is there any lessons that you've learned from working at businesses like Barclays and Auto Trade and um, these big, big businesses? Is there anything that you've picked up that you're now um, implementing at Money Supermarket? Well, that's a good question. Or not um, implementing because it's not, it doesn't work. <laughs> I think the big thing that is important is to always connect your teams with the customer um, because sometimes focus can get lost a little bit into what's important for you for either your operational excellence or you know how fast you're moving but I think as long as you focus on customer outcomes and make sure that you're delivering value at pace then I think that's that's the biggest thing and I think 
to do that, it is important to connect with your customer. Remember that you're there to drive value for the customer. And how do you, how do you connect with your customer? How do you do it in Money Supermarket or anything in particular? So we are very customer focused. We do put a lot of emphasis on making sure that our mission is quite visible to all of our, um, you know, our teams. But I think just having like a really good product team um, who help understand the customer and help guide technology teams into making sure that we are delivering value and that, you know, they are representative of the customer and they are the proxy. And it's really a product that helps us connect with uh, the customer. And I guess that comes down to your, again, management style and, and how and how you do that. I know we touched on it earlier. How would you or how would others describe your management style, do you think? Uh, good question. Or leadership style. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, so I, I hope that I'm collaborative. I think if you were to pin me in one of the colors, I'm definitely in the green quadrant, which means that I value collaboration um, over, you know, like directive or um, any other leadership styles. But I like to bring people on the journey and make sure that they all have their own voice and that that's generally how you get the best out of people when they feel listened to. I read a book ages ago and it was, it sounds a bit dark, but um, it, it was about like, getting a life plan together and that sort of thing. And the way the book started, it was asking, say, if um, if you were to write your own eulogy, how would it go? If, I guess, if how would you want to be remembered, I guess, by the people that you led or the people that you worked with? <clears throat> Gosh, that's yeah. very profound. Isn't Sorry, it? yeah. On the spot with that. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Um, for me, it would be reliable. Mm-hmm. Um, I think that knowing that people can come to me and I'll help them work through problems and that we can solve it together as a team, I think he was reliable would be my good epitaph. <laughs> nice. <laughs> what, that's the name of your book? Yes. Nice. Love it. Love it. How big is your team now? It's, it's, it's a fairly large team, isn't it? Well, we've moved into more of a matrix organization. So I largely look after our architectural functions. So the principal engineers, um, the architects, and also now our platform engineers. So if you look at my direct reports, it probably doesn't look as big, but if you look at the number of teams that I kind of like coalesce, then we're probably looking around 40 to 50 people. The the next... 12, 18 months for Money Supermarket? Is there anything we need to keep an eye out for? I mean, you mentioned that journey to a platform-based um, business. Anything, anything else we need to be keeping an eye out for, do you think? So I think what we want to do is personalize your journey on Money Supermarket, that you come to us, we understand what your goal is, what your mission, and then we help guide you along that. And I think we're looking to utilize data and machine learning much more to try and embed that into our systems. Um, so much so that, you know, people come to us and they're unsure if the choices they've made are correct and we can help surface some of that. So a good example is like life insurance. You know, it's one of those things that people tend to put off and one of the big stumbling blocks I always struggle is how much cover do I need? But if we can surface like what the general population are taking out so that we can offer some reassurance that you're making the right choices, then I think that we can help, you know, really drive something forward from like mini supermarket and also the customer. Incredible. So when we're seeing you at the, the next event and these are going to be things that you talk about, because I remember obviously I, the reason that I, I reached out to yourself for the podcast is because I saw you talk at the um, the Text in the City event, which was held at your offices, which are incredible, fantastic offices. Uh, how many floors is it? Is it two floors? Two floors, yeah. Well, I have to, I've only seen one floor, but it's, it's mega. Um, so it must be a nice place to work. <clears throat> so, um, so when we see you at the next event, hopefully you'll be talking more about this stuff, which is yeah, I'm hoping to talk at um, the Manchester Festival as well. So I've oh, submitted awesome. my papers. Hopefully that will get approved. Amazing. Right, I'll be there 100%. Um, community, I mean, because again, you're from, you're from Liverpool yourself. And I know Liverpool also has a kind of a, a strong um, tech community as well. Manchester's, of course, bigger uh, because of the sheer size. How, how would you describe the tech community in Manchester? Because you, you're quite in- integrated with that, I'd say. Yeah, how would you describe it? I would say it's thriving, really. Um, it's particularly vibrant and diverse and something that is really, I don't know, it's really quite nice to be part of, I think. You know, like yeah. some of the diversity of some of the groups and the people that you get to meet along that, it's just amazing, really. Mm. You, and because was that, have you talked to events before? Or was that one of the first? No, I have done a few. I mean, I'm not a natural speaker. Like, it's not something that I yeah. um, relish. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, I... 
I try to just because, you know, it like pushes me forward a little bit in like my own ambition to like be more confident in, in terms of like speaking in front of people. But um, yeah, I, I like talking about some of the achievements that we've done at Money Supermarket and how we've like got better as a team, removed some of the obstacles and hopefully some of the learnings that we speak about other people can take on board a little bit. Yeah, I think it comes across when speaking to you, clearly very passionate about about um, what Money Supermarket are doing. And I think you're right. I think for people coming into interview with you, what an amazing purpose to get behind. We're helping families save money on their household bills. Like, how can you not? How can you disagree with that? <laughs> um, just, I guess, coming to the end of this, I mean, it turns out like uh, interviewing, because that's what the, where that question came from. When you are interviewing people, what, what kind of process do you take? What's the... It's a good question. We um we really struggled, I would say, probably more than two years ago. Um, and then actually we put a lot of emphasis on making sure that the candidate had a really good experience when they come to Money Supermarket, that they, you know, we've got a really short cycle in terms of like getting feedback to people, getting people booked in for an interview. We might try and make sure that all of the phases are kind of crunched up into one so that we can give that quicker feedback. But what we try to do is help give you enough visibility into what life at Money Supermarket's like and help and the people that you will meet in the interview process hopefully relay that a little bit. You know, a lot of the questions we get asked is, what is life like at Money Supermarket? Um, and I think that the people that you will meet on there will be able to give you a good answer. But we also make sure that we try and remove as much bias from the process as possible. Because um, I think... If you leave interviewing down to individual basis, you know, like the hiring manager, then you kind of end up with like a bit of a pocketed approach to like how good the experience, how good an experience a candidate would get. But by having like a defined structure where we've got like a rigorous set of questions that we answer, ask all of our candidates in the same format, it gives everybody that opportunity to represent themselves in the same way. Yeah, that's a, so yeah, it's just a, a, a template and do you, do you ever veer from the template depending on the person? Yeah, I mean, it, it's basically a, a guideline to the script and, you know, people tend to answer questions differently. Um, and, you know, that's re usually where we'll try to veer off and understand like what they're trying to do. But, um, but yeah, it's really just to try and remove bias from the process as much as possible that the people that you're are interviewing with you have like a, a set script to follow almost and it helps them understand... Um, more about you. What, what do you look for usually when you're interviewing? Is there anything in particular? So we put much less emphasis on your previous skills um, and it's more about you as an individual um, and what you can bring to the organisation and your behaviour as opposed to the adaptability. And, and why is that? Because that, that seems like the opposite of, of what people interviewing have always thought, looking at, um, obviously, personality and character comes into it, but just not, bothered, not, not too bothered about the skills though. I mean, it's still important, right? It's nice to find that person who's got that depth of understanding in your particular technology stack. But we really value and we understand that actually if you're a good engineer, those things come naturally to people and moving into a different technology stack isn't as much of a challenge as finding the person with the right attitude and the behavior. What, what is the right attitude and behavior? I think it's enthusiasm and passion for what they're doing and wanting to collaborate with the team. So... There was obviously that anti-pattern that people spoke about around the 10 times developer. And while they are useful... What, what do you mean by that? Sorry, I, I haven't heard that. So 10x developer was a bit of an anti-pattern, I suppose, from a number of years where there was this thought that you could get like one individual developer who could represent many developers. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, we value more of a team that we see that people collaborating together and working alongside each other actually produces much more benefit because it's that diversity of thought that helps you build better technology. Yeah, and again, it's coming back to that collaboration piece that you were talking about before and that, that diversity piece as well because that's such an interesting thing you said there where um, obviously people know the benefits of having a, a diverse workforce so, you know, the, the universally agreed upon. Um, <clears throat> but I didn't, something I didn't think about was because the, how else would you connect with your incredibly diverse customer base if your teams weren't diverse yeah, if it's one if it's one person always solving the problem then you've only got one person's opinion and 
allowing people to push forward their thoughts and ideas, you quite often find someone will come up with a better way of doing it or a novel approach. And it's that collaborative collaboration that really drives things. It, say you weren't in a money supermarket, so you had a million pounds yeah. uh, that you were given. So what business would you start, do you think? Is, do you think there's a gap in the market at all? Do you think someone should start a business if they have a spare million knocking about? Are you just trying to collect people's business <laughs> ideas? And like Basically. Basically. Like We've been track. rumbled, Nick. We've been rumbled. <laughs> it's a good question. I, I mean, aside from like maybe just creating a travel blog and uh, <laughs> like allowing people to follow that where I visited and the places that I'm meeting at, um, that would be the dream, I suppose. But it's a good question. I think... There's probably two things. And I know that, you know, like big social media platforms like Facebook and Instagram are doing a lot um, to help in this. But I think it'd be good to have a really socially responsible social platform. Um, I see the effect, I think, on particularly younger, the younger generation around like, you know, what plat these platforms can do to people in terms of like, you know, 24 access to bullying all of those problems you know like the fear of projecting the best image of yourself all the time i feel like there's a real opportunity to create a more socially acceptable platform i love that yeah that's that's so true it's it's and i even find myself sometimes i've i've now during the week deleted instagram because oh my god i just get hooked and i haven't downloaded tiktok because if i did i wouldn't get anything done you know, I'm terrible for TikTok, <laughs> but I, I'm not sure how to solve the problem. But I feel like the anonymity really helps people hide behind personas and, you know, adds fuel to like the bullying that happens and all of the trolling. But if you were verified as you as an individual and we knew who you were, would you actually be so confident in some of the things that people say to each other? I don't know. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, that's that, that's very interesting because there is. Um, I've seen this new social uh, social platform come up. Uh, Be real. Have you seen that? No, I've not. If someone stole my idea, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Damn. Um, I'm going to come up with a, uh, a home delivery uh, restaurant network. I think. Oh no, it's already been done. Um, no, but it was basically um, Be real. <clears throat> you you have to you get a random notification each day where you have to post um, a picture of yourself. And a picture of what you're looking at it's just randomly any time of the day i think it's between waking hours obviously because otherwise it'd be ridiculous um and it kind of forces you to be real because you just, it's there and then you have to you have to post there and then uh that's quite nice yeah that's good i don't think it solves the the like i said the, the verification issue that, that yeah because i think a lot there's a lot of keyboard warriors out there who i think you're right in any other given circumstance they wouldn't say half the things they say but because they get to hide behind this persona is quite um yeah it's quite dangerous uh, i think yeah one one other thing that would be nice if somebody could solve the problem as well is um so i think there's a lot of new streaming platforms coming up you know like netflix prime you've got disney plus hey you as my wife likes to watch all of the reality shows on there but it'd be nice if you could have something that auto switches you so you tell them what you're interested in watching and it kind of like plans out when you should watch something and auto switches you between these platforms. So you're only paying one monthly fee rather than paying multiple fees each month. Oh, okay. Interesting. I went to an event ages ago and everyone was, everyone was hating on Netflix and saying they, they're suggested things of no, you know, of no relevance to me, anything like that. Um, and the guy made a fair point. He said, "But well, do you ever leave a review or or any sort of kind of guidance for them to figure out what you're actually going to watch. And everyone was kind of like, mm, no, we don't, unfortunately. It's like, yeah, you need to give them a chance, you know. Um, but yeah, okay, that, I like it. I like it, interesting. Look, last question that we're going to be finishing it on. Yeah. Um, today's your last day on earth, right? Uh, apart from, apart from obviously being on this podcast and spending time with family, what, what would you be doing if you knew this was your last day on earth? So I really like, Motorsports, so I'd probably go and steal a really good car and nice. just have a bit of a... Grand Theft Auto would be what <laughs> yeah. you were doing last day. <laughs> yeah, I think so, yeah. Um, go and find like a nice Ferrari or a Lamborghini and just have a bit of a joyride in that. Oh, amazing. I could just go to a dealership and pretend I was going to buy, I suppose. But you know. <laughs> yeah. But where's the danger in that, right? Yeah, exactly. Where's the thrill? What, what car would you go with if you had to pick one? A Lamborghini, I think. Yeah, any particular model? Uh, I think probably the Huracan. Nice, okay, okay. 
Okay, I've seen a different side to you today, Mikey. Yeah. Wow. Uh, well, look, thank you for thank, <laughs> thank you for coming on. It's been amazing. Excited to see where Money Supermarket are in the next eighteen months. Yeah. And um, yeah, and thank you for coming on. Best luck with everything. Cool. Thank you very much, Jack. Thanks for having me. <laughs>